Donc, je suis très heureux de, de passer la parole à notre collègue, le professeur Graham Barker, qui vient de l'Université de Cambridge et qui euh, a longuement travaillé dans ce site de d'AOFTA euh, en Libye, dont il va nous, nous parler maintenant. Merci. Je suis désolé de parler en français. Les, les images, j'espère, sont en français. Um, in fact, I think it's a good example to follow Amri Lazine's paper because if we're trying to understand the relationships between people and climate, the big challenge for us is to move from the global fine information about climate change down to how was it actually experienced by the kind of people that we're trying to study. And so we're all trying to piece this relationship between very fine, large-scale records and gradually trying to understand how climate change might have been experienced at the, at the local level. And that really is what um, this talk is about. So the Halfatir cave is in the, the Jebel Akhdar, which is Arabic for la montagne vert, the green mountain. So it is, in effect, an island of landscape that is like southern Greece and Crete, surrounded by sea and desert today. And this is the, how the Jebel Akhdar is. You see the cave I'm talking about is on the coast. There's a steep set of escarpments here, and then the high plateau, it's about a um, thousand meters above sea level, and then you move down very swiftly to the pre-desert and then to the desert, over a matter you can see of 60, 70 kilometers. It's a very telescoped landscape. This is the Haafatir cave, so it's on the coast of Libya, two or three hours drive east of Benghazi, and it looks out over the sea. And it was excavated in the early 1950s by the Cambridge prehistorian Charles McBurney. He excavated a 14-meter deep trench in the middle of the cave, the cave floor. You can see this was the eventual shape of it. This here is the upper part there. And he found a sequence that, as Jean-Jacques has said, is in many ways has been unrivaled in North Africa. It's certainly one of the most important sequences eventually published in that book in 1967. He found this sequence. He defined a set of phases. He had a classical occupation over the last two or three thousand years, from Greco-Roman up to the present. In fact, here, this is the last 10,000 years. He had Neolithic and what he called Capsian of Neolithic, of, of uh, a, a Capsian like that in the Maghreb, uh, Iba Marusian, um, which he, um, he dated, you can see here, from 7,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. He then had a late Paleolithic, sorry, that's by the Iba Marusian at 15,000. Below that was a, a European style. He was using a European style uh, terminology and also term frames of reference. He called them the Daban period, had these blades, and he could date it back to 40,000 years ago. Below that, radiocarbon dating couldn't reach. So he had to estimate what he found below. And below, he found industries of that lavaloiso mysterian type that Shannon was talking about early this morning. And below that, another strange industry, which was also seen now as Middle Stone Age, but he called pre-orignation because of links he saw with the Near East. And there were two human mandibles found in these Lavaloiso mysterian layers. So we're down here now. Basically, this, the deep sounding, is, is this number one. And these ones here, for the middle part there. And at the time, because they seem very, very, very big, strong, primitive, robust, uh, he, uh, they were described as Neanderthaloid, like Neanderthal. But years ago, Jean-Jacques Hubin showed that they were definitely modern human. This is anatomically modern human, AMH. So I was invited to renew excavations at the site. Um, and 
The main fieldwork started in 2007. It was funded by the European Research Council largely, and so it had this name TRANSNAP, standing for Cultural Transformations and Environmental Transitions in North African Prehistory. And the project, the, the centerpiece was the re-excavation of the Haufatir, but we did a lot of work also around the rest of the landscape. There were three main components. One was to re-excavate the cave, directed by Tim Reynolds. The other was to conduct a lot of geoarchaeology in the landscape of the Jebel Akhtar, directed by Tim Reynolds. Then also we went back to the McBurney archive, that's both the paper record, the photographs, and virtually all the finds, the artifacts and the bones and so on, uh, in the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Cambridge. So first of all, we had to find the McBurney Trench because he refilled it at the end. That's on the very first day of the project in 2007. And over the years, we re-excavated it entirely down to the 14 metres. It's obviously a, a huge task. Having cleaned the faces, um, we found the McBurney faces. It still had his metal labels down the side in many places. We then did modern recording, sampling for all the kinds of dating of the techniques that we've heard about this morning, um, collecting also lots of indicators to tell us about climate, environment. Tefer is volcanic ash. These are uh, volcanic eruptions from Greece and in particular Italy where the dust blew into the cave, very important chronological markers. And we also conducted very small scale new excavations down the side of the McBurney Trench. So this trench here, you can see just it's a two meter by one meter cut down there. And then we did a similar one down there. And we also made a very small excavation. We found more sediment below where McBurney stopped down here. We stopped in 2013 when security collapsed with the murder of the American ambassador in Benghazi. Um, but the excavations were completed in 2015, meaning the, the base of this trench, the base of this trench, so we now have a continuous sequence, and I should say in the Holocene too, by colleagues from the Libyan Department of Antiquities. And I think this is a useful time to say that the, in, in, in a periods of extraordinary difficulty, beyond anything really in the many other difficult regions of North Africa, the Libyan Department of, Acti of Antiquities have been amazing at researching the sites, conserving the sites, maintaining the sites, protecting the sites. Um, and they, and th these were people who'd worked with us all the way through the project. They undertook some further training with us in the UK and they finished the work brilliantly. Um, and as with all of these sorts of excavations, they're small scale, they're very slow compared to what people like Charles McBurney could do in the 1950s because every bucket of stratified soil has to be washed and screened and so all the organic remains are washed out like this um, and then all of the residues are washed and cleaned and dried and people then spend hours and hours and hours trying to pick out everything larger than two millimetres. You're aiming for that kind of uh, extreme recovery. So as with all of these sorts of projects, the half the team, or less than half, are in the cave and the other half are doing that kind of work. This is some examples of the geoarchaeology in the landscape. We have various pollen sequences. We have dendrochronology going back several hundred years from olive trees. We were dating ancient raised beaches of periods of, sea, of higher sea level like this. We have some deep cores uh, in what are now dried up lake basins. We conducted surveys uh, for artifacts, uh, archaeological survey right down into the desert. These are some of the Middle Stone Age hand axes that came from these deposits in order to make maps of, of where people were in different periods. And these are examples of some of the finds in Cambridge, so the work we did, we have all the records from the McBurney period, his notebooks, his records, plus you can see here photographs, sediment samples, lithics, that's the flints, the animal bones, the shells, and this is typical, a 1950s biscuit box full of lithic debitage. 
And that's the team that was involved, about 20 institutions, which again is typical of the kind of projects that we're talking about today. Um, and you can see there from the range of university departments, museums and so on that they, the, the team come from. And none of these, the names matter, but just to give you a flavor of that, we have a series of, of different people looking, uh, and you can see some of them have mentioned already, Rainer Grun and dating. So several laboratories and several people involved in different methods of dating, several people involved in different approaches to the various kinds of artifacts, particularly the stone tools, a whole range of people from different laboratories working on different kinds of material that we've collected to tell us about climate, environment, subsistence, and other aspects in terms of things like symbolic material culture. We were able to put forward a, a new chrono stratigraphy for the McBurney excavation. Um, we were first able to date, really, the, Mc, the McBurney phases taking them as if they were real phases. Um, and, the, and then we also, this is by, mostly by radiocarbon, we also had this, these techniques talked about OSL dating of feldspar, which, which can take you much earlier. And, and these were published in a second paper here. And the headline result really was the half a tier sequence. As I said, McBurney could date it back by radiocarbon to about 40,000, and he thought it went back to 80,000, and actually now we know it goes back to about 140,000. And you've seen these charts before, this world global climate model or, or reconstruction of today's climates here, similar climates in this uh, MIS-5, the interglacial periods has been talked about with phases, and then these extraordinary changes through getting right down to this coldest period, the last glacial maximum that we heard about from Anne-Marie. So we had a set of sedimentary phases dated, and then these were the McBurney phases in terms of where he placed them in the stratigraphy. We were able to define a set of fasces, sedimentary types, five major ones published by Robin Inglis for her PhD, uh, right the way through the sequence from the bottom to the top, and broadly they correlate in a broad way with these global climate stages that you've heard about, the marine isotope stages. So we have down the base of the trench that deep sounding sediments that formed in warm, humid climates. And then there was a period of dramatically oscillating climates that are broadly placed in what we call MIS-4. And so what you see here are these, are these sediments changing from warm and humid to dry and changing like that. And then gradually the dominant feature is it got increasingly cold and dry, and so what mostly you're seeing here are stones coming down from the cave roof in cold, icy conditions, breaking off from the cave roof. And then the last 10,000 years, this is this earlier period that Amory talked about when it was wetter than today, and then it became drier, and there's increasing signs of human activity, human presence, culminating with animals being kept in the cave. So that's at the big scale, but this also gives you an example of the small-scale reconstruction we were trying to do. You've seen some of these images before of this technique of micromorphology, where a block of sediment is taken out and then it's impregnated with um, wax and eventually a glass slide is cut through it. So what you're seeing here is a piece of, the, of this 14-metre sediment, perhaps 10 centimetres, of the 14 metres of the half a tier, and we have a sequence more or less continuous uh, down most of it. And you can see here, just from this tiny little window, apart from fragments of dung, fragments of bone, but also Robin uh, English's interpretation, this is a period when there was still water, standing water in the cave, and then there were some kind of flood events, weather's changing, water's washing in in floods, it goes back to being still water, then there's some kind of hiatus and, and flood events again. So you can see the, the task of us trying to move from these kind of specifics to these big world models and to understand human behavior to it. And the very fine scale excavation brought out things that McBurney observed some and not others, different kind of 
of, of contacts and changes um, in, in the trench sequence. And, and what these add up to is that whereas the original idea, we see the same climate model, is you had those periods that I talked about, pre-orignation and so on, all the way through here. This was the original idea. Um, and then what we can actually see is that there are major sedimentary and occupation hiatuses. So the Hauerfatir was known as one of the longest continuous occupation sequences in North Africa. It's one of the longest discontinuous occupation sequences in North Africa. And that is probably typical of most cave occupation sites, indeed in many parts of Europe as well in this period. So what you can see, we know that there were occupations earlier in the deep sounding, this pre-orignation, the MIS-5 period, and then there's a phase of Lavalois mousterian nothing, a second phase of Lavalois mousterian nothing, then this Dabon period, the beginning of these upper Paleolithic type blades, a big gap, another phase, and then the later ones not shown there. So that's a, a very crude version I did last night. And that is the reality of this kind of deep cave, of a set of occupations of different types punctuated by short hiatuses, hiatuses of a couple of thousand years, hiatuses of 20,000 years. And just to go very quickly through what's emerging from this story, down in this deep sounding, we're dealing with this period, this MIS-5, the last interglacial. We have the first human presence, these MSA industries that McBurney called pre-orignation. And we know that there were these major wet and humid phases within MIS-5, punctuated with phases that were more arid, colder and more arid. And the OSL dates fit these episodes, and you can see them here in the stratigraphy, and you can see them here too. So it looks like in this period when it's the green Sahara we just heard about, and then you had periods of, of, of comparative dryness and back again, people are clearly coming to the cave at this time. What are they doing? Well, also, who are they? Um, the, the, the mandibles that Jean-Jacques looked at come from immediately above at the top of this sequence. So we have to try to argue without fossils that these are probably, probably the same modern humans. They're hunting Barbary sheep, which was the main wild, the wild goat. It was the main prey all the way through the sequence. Gazelle, aurochs, hartebeest. They were fishing. It's clear that we have large fish, which cannot be fish that could have, say, been brought up by birds. There are fish bones in the cave. They were collecting shellfish. They were collecting land snails. We think there's some evidence that they're collecting plants. There are these perforated shells right down at the bottom, and these are these tools. So it, it seems to be some kind of coastal humid phase adaptation in this island, this Jeblachdar island, by modern humans, because there's nothing really like it to the west or the, in the desert or the south or the east. Then it looks as if... We now move into MIS-4, this period 71 to 57,000. This is this period of these dramatically fluctuating climates. Um, we have, it, it, there are the indicators of increasing aridity. And then we have people who have this levalloiseau mousterian technologies that we heard about later, this levalloise technologies. There in that period, this is the period of the Homo sapiens mandibles, there's evidence for this massive burning of, of, of hearths. We think it may be burning grass. It's very unclear why, but it's a big, thick level at this time associated with them. There are hints of these Aterian technologies that we've heard about, and we don't understand them, but at the fine detail of excavation, it looks like we can see Lavalois mysterian lithics in the wet phase different kinds of lithics in the dry phase, in particular the beginnings of these dab and blades, back again to the Valois and Mysterian. McBurney himself thought he could see mixtures, and we can see, we think we can see some, some, kind of adapt, some kind of relationship between technologies and climate in this changing period. But then 
there's a hiatus of 15,000 years. Nobody's in the cave, as far as we can see. And then people have come back again with the same technologies from 50 to 42,000 years ago. And then there's another hiatus. And so the, the question for us is, is it simply that people are using another cave a kilometer away? Or is it that we are seeing genuine failure to adapt to climate changes and so on? These terribly small-scale populations that we're talking about all today, communities which would have been as big as the number of people here, not the number of people here, separated by huge distances, are these periods where the Jebel Akhtar as a whole is abandoned. And then we move to this next phase we heard is we, we see phases of increasing aridity, but as we can see, we also have, as we saw, it, it's, it's not a simple story of increasing aridity, as we saw in the previous talk. After this long hiatus, people come back in this period, 40 to 1,000 year, years ago, with these upper Paleolithic, late Stone Age in the African literature, blade industries. The, we have isotopes from the teeth of the animals they were hunting, which tells us about significant aridity. Um, but also people are here, what these are, are the land snails that people were collecting for food. And you can see these, these punctuated episodes when people are there. These are microscopic evidence from the, the micromorphology of bone fragments, phytolith rich dung, phytolith are small pieces of plants, and trampling, of perhaps humans and animals, we don't know. But there seem to be dramatic changes in technologies, which we heard about too, of, of people developing ways of, of hunting better in, in more, more difficult, meaning more open landscapes. Um, uh, w people have studied the, the damage on the ends of the tools, and the points have got impact damage where they've, they've been striking animals. And at the base of these Daban lithics, Giuseppina Mutri has found the striations, the marks of the hafting, and also the fibre, the string bindings around. Clearly, we're dealing with some kind of projectile points. She also had evidence for scraping wood, perhaps making wooden tools as well, and cutting plants, and new strategies for dealing with increasing aridity. And they included seed and nut processing. This is one of the the grinding stones from this period, well dated to 31,000, it's now been published, where there are use wear on it and organic residues on it. They're grinding seeds, particularly of this goat grass, and they're also grinding up pine nuts on the stone. And these things presumably take a lot of time to collect. They're hard work, but, but they're becoming, if you like, necessary. Uh, it's an important resource that's, that's now being collected. And indeed, this story from the Haofatea around that sort of period, around 30,000, in many other different parts of the world, there's similar evidence of people also now using these difficult to process, slow to process. You can see here, compared to the, the effort to get acorns, to get roots, to get tubers, it's a lot of work for not much, but clearly it, it, it's, it's an important part of how you survive. Then there's this hiatus between the early and the late Dabon of uh, 8,000 years, something like so. And then people start to reuse the cave again. And this is now around the last glacial maximum, this period of, of maxima aridity, uh, the most difficult times in many ways for many of the human populations around the world. And yet, amazingly, this was the time we know people are into... Uh, Siberia, they cross into America, um, and they've got, um, you know, it, it's a, a period of extraordinary expansion uh, across the world, um, well into Australia by now, long in. Um, what we find in this period of maximum aridity, it's actually also the period of the most intensive use of the cave. Um, and you can see here, we have very strange, in, in the excavations here, we found a whole series of, of post holes. There's some kind of wooden structures. We don't know what they mean. Are they making shelters inside the cave? But the cave has, gives them shelter. Are they things to do with, with, with wooden structures for hides, for, for scraping hides, for drying meat? We, we don't know. We haven't found them before. We haven't found them afterwards. Hunting and gathering at this time, 
the same work on useware and the residues, hunting, hide working, plant processing, the study of the animal bones, all year round hunting, intensive butchery, the land snails, intensive collection of these as a plant food as well. The shellfish too, people are now collecting them all year round where it was a seasonal activity before and it was to become a seasonal activity afterwards. And there's evidence that there was also overpredation. The, 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 snail, the shells get smaller because they're not having time to grow before people are, are collecting them. And they're also gathering plants and they're storing plants. There's another technique of ways of dealing with aridity. We have all of these different sorts of evidence, the pine um, and other sorts of vetches and so on like this, juniper, acorns, grasses, legumes, fruits, pine kernels. So these things, they're like fruits, they're learning how to, to cut them, to dry them, uh, and also they're probably storing the pine in these whole um, cones and then putting them into the fire to release them. So it looks as if at this period of maximum aridity, when it looks like the Sahara around was abandoned, around the Jebel Akhtar, the, 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 the populations are highly centralised here, and, and there, there seem a number of pointers that this may have been a refugium for quite isolated human populations. Um, isolated in one way, but actually, again, this enigma, um, it's actually... The, the tools now, the toolkits these people are using, now look extremely like those in the Maghreb. And so how these connections are, we know that the Gulf of Sirt between the end of the Maghreb and the here is one of the most difficult regions to cross on Earth and was so then. And yet this is a period when there seem to be connections, one of the rare times when there seem to be correct, uh, connections across North Africa. Um, we saw this figure um, earlier, um, the, uh, the, the Cooper model. In fact, we, there were earlier periods, and, and what that study suggested uh, in the, the western desert part of Egypt is in, in the driest periods, the end of the Pleistocene, people had to concentrate in the Nile Valley. Then in that humid early Holocene period, people were able to spread out, um, and then gradually as it started to get uh, more deserts, um, this is four or five thousand years ago, uh, people were concentrating more. Um, that's really been the, the main general model. In fact, we're unclear how, how, how much the Jebel Akhtar was affected. What these show, this is a study of phytoliths. These are uh, a PhD student working on the bird bones, and these are the reconstruct. These are where the birds are coming from, excluding the birds that have been that have lived and died in the cave. Um, so we have here woodland, semi-desert wetlands all the way through, and what we can see is early on the early Holocene. This is between 12,000 and 8,000 years ago. Birds from open woodland, semi-desert wetlands. So the birds from the cave are able to reach up onto the Jebel and down. And then as it later, more open, less woodland. Uh, and then gradually it gets, it does generally get uh, much drier later on. Um, and what we see then in this period, there are no extreme climate shifts that we can see. It was a landscape of trees and shrubs. It later became more open vegetation. People were now collecting shells, the, the, the marine shells, just in winter, and this is when we get particular signs of resource stress, gathering wild glasses, hunting much as before. Domestic sheep and goat appear after 8.2 years, 8.2 thousand, and that's known as the 8.2 event, which was a, a short, sharp phase around the world of a climate deterioration. Um, and, and for whatever reason, it's soon after that that we have the bones of domestic sheep and goat in the cave, and there are arguments about whether these people acquired sheep and goat, domestic animals, from the Egypt and the Levant, where they came from ultimately, or possibly from the populations in the Sahara. And there's no evidence for cultivation. This is a, one of the small caves we also excavated, um, it's a little cave on the coast, small excavation, two metres by one metre. You can see here, the same as McBurney found in the Haofatea, this Mesolithic, Neolithic, 
They're extraordinarily the same. Virtually everything's the same, apart from there are some bones of domestic sheep and goats. So you can see here the lithics, um, the, the bits of animal bone, the shells that were being collected. It's really a, a hunter-gatherer mode of subsistence combining after 8,000 years ago in ways we don't understand how keeping sheep and goat. And that's a common pattern across much of North Africa, apart from in the northwest Maghreb, where there is evidence for cereals appearing, probably from Spain, but actually also they seem to be a tiny, tiny percentage of the way people lived. So the first appearance of domestic sheep and goat after 8.2, no evidence for crop cultivation. They were harvesting wild plants like sorghum, and only in the Greco-Roman period, only with the coming of the Greek colonies, the last thousand years BC, is the present landscape there. The landscape of cereals, of olives, of sheep and goat and so on, that's really only 2,000 years old, sorry, 3,000 years old uh, in the Jebel Akhtar. So that's a, a run through this sequence that's emerging from the cave. It is one of the major deep archaeological histories. As I said, it's a punctuated story, not a continuous story, as it's been regarded, but it's a much more interesting story. I didn't talk much about this complex history of cultural interactions. I haven't talked much about that. But what I have tried to talk about is the way humans responded to climate change was complicated. And in a way, this is the kind of work that archaeologists are producing in other different other parts of the world and also in different periods to say that we can learn from the past, but the past is complicated because we are a complicated species. We perceive things like climate change in different ways and different times. We're capable of taking wise decisions, capable of taking stupid decisions. And this story of the cave, in some ways, is probably telling us something of that, of successful adaptations. I sometimes think that archaeologists are prone to describe the past as if it's a record of success. Um, and, of course, the failures also result in the lithics that we find, as well as the successes. So it is an interesting story, and it's a story that contributes to a lot of efforts by a lot of archaeologists to try to understand this relationship between climate change and human responses, which, of course, has a modern resonance as well. Thank you. Thank you.